everybody. Hi. <laughs> Hello? Hello? Kinda? Can you hear me? Hi. Hey. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Welcome to the 12th annual MICA Talks. We're so happy to have everybody here with us. Um, we also want to give a shout out to Human Being Productions for the closed captionings and recording of this evening. Um, so here we have John Che, we have Iselina, and we also have Tyler. So they're gonna be our presenters for this evening. So yeah, these three right here. <laughs> Today's theme for the night is transformation. The art world has always been interlinked, whether in the style of art, new perspectives, or media. In addition, transformations that happen in the verbal language to art have historically altered the way we communicate to this day. Our artists today have contributed to the transformation of art in their respective ways. In terms of transformation refers to the change in shape or appearance of something. In the process of making art, a material, idea, or person is transformed to produce the end result. To start off, let me reintroduce Tyler Washington. Tyler is a storyboard artist working in the animation industry. She graduated from the Maryland Institute College of Art in the spring of 2020 with a BFA in animation and a concentration in illustration. Her work typically depicts themes about character relationships and finding joy in the small things. When she's not working, she's probably doing yoga or reading on the couch beside her dog, Nori. She thanks Brit. Brandy's role as Cinderella for inspiring her to enter the animation industry and bring more diversity to animation. Please give a round of applause for Tyler. Hi, Micah. Hi. <laughs> Happy Black History Month. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I graduated in the summer of 2020, which I think at this point we all know was the year the pandemic hit. Um, so I missed out on my art walk, unfortunately, which kind of led to me uh, not graduating with a disability in any way or like a, a handicap, but I did lose an opportunity that would have been really helpful after graduating. But I did happen to get into a couple of um, gallery shows that were held like purposely for seniors ever graduating during the pandemic, and I got a scholarship from one of them from a storyboard artist, Monica Davila, for my storyboards and my animation thesis. So that was really exciting. Um, and then also I graduated, unfortunately, at the height of the Black Lives Matter movement in 2020. So again, like a situation that brought a lot of, I think, clarity to like race relations to America and like a lot of good and bad. But one of the small positives that came out of that is that a lot of artists in my field of animation were offering portfolio reviews. And I got to like meet a lot of really big names, like Daniel Chung of uh, We Bear Bears. <laughs> Not many people watch cartoons, but We Bear Bears. Um, I met Dana Terrace of Owl House, um, and they all gave me portfolio reviews and really helpful like steps for help me grow my career after graduating. So after graduating, I started looking for work, <laughs> and looking for work, <laughs> and looking for work because unfortunately. Um, I was graduating at a time where the animation industry was booming, so like everyone was looking for jobs, and I just happened to be one of the people who were also looking for jobs. Um, and so, because I couldn't break in right away, I started looking for mentorships instead, because you know, sometimes you can't get a job, it's not so much that no one's hiring, it's that you haven't met the skill set yet. So I was like, well, if that's the case, then let me like learn the skill set. So I started looking for mentorships, and I got one from this really nice supervising director, Jim Mortensen, who runs Story for All and one from WIA, uh, Women in Animation. So both of those, I met a Nickelodeon storyboard artist and a Netflix storyboard artist who spent like months of their time teaching me how to storyboard and get really good at like the nitty gritty so that I can get that entry level position I always wanted. So here's what my first storyboards looked like for Jim. Um, and they might look good to you guys, but looking back on them now, I'm like, oh my God, my compositions are horrible. <laughs> but, um, and here's the latest one I did for Jim. Um, I have a little bit more understanding of how to like set up compositions, foregrounds, backgrounds, and tell a story and a simple image, which is like what storyboarders have to do. Um, so I still couldn't get a full-time job, so I had to move on to freelance. <laughs> um, 
And what I did get right after graduating was this beautiful one called Goat Girl, which is being produced in Ireland. So unfortunately, they couldn't hire me free time because of legal issues. But <laughs> I got to do their trailer. And uh, you can see on the left-hand side that that's like what I drew first. And the red lines are what my director would give back to me so that I can clean it up and make it look like the far, far left. Um, and then I also did some motion graphics design because I am an animation major. <laughs> I know how to animate. And I got this freelance from a MICA student uh, who happened to know me from a previous class. And she recommended me for this job. So I know everyone's always going to like tell you, but please be nice to people. <laughs> like Your classmates are going to be the people who like give you jobs in the future. Like It's just a fact. Like They will be able to offer you a lot of opportunities that just networking above you might not be able to get to you. But I did that cute little chicken. <laughs> That's Birdie. Um, and then I also, this is going to play in silent, but I also got to do an adult swim bumper uh, for Tuca and Birdie before it got canceled. <laughs> and um, it's just them kind of enjoying their day. And it was really fun because they reached out to me because it was like part of their Juneteenth um, bumper series, and they wanted more black animators to work on bumper reels, and I got to choose Tuca and Birdie. And then, uh, I don't like freelance, so I just put this here. <laughs> uh, I think it's a little confusing to me, so I really was always trying in between my freelance gigs to try to find a full-time union position in animation as a storyboard artist, uh, because I don't like getting emails with things like Q2 and official booking <laughs> and asking me my rates. So. After two years of hard work from 2020 to May 2022, I finally got a job at Netflix, guys. Yeah. But then they canceled my show. <laughs> so I was laid off in October for my first job ever. It was really like saddening. Um, <laughs> so, you know, all that hard work is just to say that, you know, you work really hard for an end goal, and sometimes that end goal happens, and like it gets taken from you in the most heartbreaking way. But the like, the grind doesn't stop, the hustle doesn't stop, right? So, I am freelance again, but I actually have good news. As of uh, last Thursday, I'm employed again <laughs> at Titmouse, which um, I'm sure my animation people will know. Titmouse is an animation company that's in LA, New York, and Vancouver, and they've worked on things such as Legend of Vox Machina. Uh, Star Trek's Lower Decks, and I'm working on a new unannounced show, I can't tell you, but um, I will be a sort of revisionist on that starting next week, so I am employed again. Um, but yeah, just to wrap it up, I have some quick tips for what helped me uh, after I graduated. So like I said, be nice, do good work, stay in contact with everyone you meet, try to join a group like Women in Animation, um, WIA or like Story for All, and then like post during things, update as much as you can, and I think the hardest thing I really want to nail in is like learning does not stop after you graduate. Like you got to keep going. Like sometimes you graduate and a lot of people think that I'm done. I don't have to learn anyone else. I don't have to learn anymore. I'm just going to want to get a job. And that's not true. Sometimes you have to continue learning. And that's the beauty of being alive and being a human being is that you get to continue learning. So yeah, just thanks for having me. And <laughs> I hope you guys have a great freshman year. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tyler. <laughs> um, I really appreciate your insight into what you do after graduation. And I'm sorry your show got canceled. <laughs> I feel really bad. Um, I'm going to reintroduce uh, Isolina. Um, Isolina Minjong is a visual artist based in Brooklyn, New York. Isolina gradu graduated MICA in 2020. And um, Isolina's main themes are surrounding the blending of history of the monument and cartoon imagery. Isolina sculpts ceramic protagonists known as woogies, adorned with symbols functioning as markers of the time spent and people loved. Isolina's hope is to reorient the viewer's sentiment towards ceramics into one that is satirical, critical, and kind. Everyone, please welcome Isolina. Hello, I'm gonna put a timer on. Okay, sorry about that. Um, hi, my name is Isolina. Oh, sorry. Hi, my name is Isolina, 
And uh, yes, I'm a sculptor and I'm very happy that I was able to get introduced to ceramics at this school. It changed my life. So this is a little bit of my work. And so I think you're probably wondering like, what you do with a ceramics degree. So what I did when I first moved to New York after graduating was to be a studio technician. And this is at one of the oldest ceramic studios in New York City called Greenwich House. And so on top of helping a studio kind of function and flow, I also do a lot of teaching. And so those are a lot of studios that I worked at previously, including Baltimore Clayworks, District Clay. And uh, when I'm not teaching, I do a lot of artist assistantships. And so I'm currently working with one of our past uh, professors, Ajay. And that's been really sweet at his studio in West Elm. And um, so all of those things have kind of culminated into my practice that started at MICA. So here's a little bit about what I did, or here's a little bit of um, what I did here. And it wouldn't have really been able to come into fruition without meeting Victoria Jang. And she worked under Akio Takamori, whose work I really love. And um, this passing of traditions is something that's like really powerful that happens in ceramics. So when I first started and kind of found ceramics here at MICA, I immediately was suggested to go to Baltimore Clayworks and be not only an intern, but an instructor. So that's why I learned a lot about how you can communicate through your materials and through your medium to people and just have it speak beyond you. When I was here, I worked under Andrea Keys Connell and Misty Gamble. Um, the department was able to introduce me to them through fellowships and through inviting them to teach. So this school really takes care of you and introduces you to some of the most brilliant people that could really mentor you. And I think that's something that Tyler mentioned that I think is super important. So after I graduated, I worked under, um, or I kind of like was searching for ways to continue ceramics during the pandemic. And so one of those ways was going to the Color Network just to talk about a little bit of a, you know, kind of a, I guess like an answer to all of my questions. And so I was introduced to Sana Musasama and April Felipe. And from there, I reached out to about like 40 artists all over uh, the US asking if they needed help and um, if they wanted a lot of enthusiastic help at that. And so I traveled to North Carolina to work under Christina Cordova. And all of that goes to say that like, um, those people really helped me find a way to pave um, kind of like a name for myself in this field, which begins with my practice. So hundreds of pounds of clay are wedged and thrown into sheets of this type of like flesh where I create all of these people. And they definitely come from uh, my different kind of cultural backgrounds and making sense of that in this contemporary context of ceramics. And so unifying like that old history with kind of contemporary like animation um, really helps kind of for me like fabricate a new language that I could better understand and comprehend the world with. So uh, during my time here, I experimented with a lot of surfacing and kind of going back and forth with this like material ambiguity, working with ceramic processes and with things that you could find at a hardware store. So those are a couple of um, the ways in which I was able to fabricate my work. Uh, right after graduating, if you want to do residencies, it's really cool to like learn at this really cool institution how to photograph your work. And so working under my professors here, I was able to develop portfolios um, and just wish to, in which I could like share that with organizations and opportunities. So it's kind of like uh, unorthodox ceramics, but it was definitely, it's something that I'm trying to learn how to like find my voice in. So since moving to New York, I've shown a bunch of my work um, and have met the most beautiful people I ever have. I've done a few residencies during my time, um, exhibited at kind of like fine art fairs and different, um, at different, uh, just like creative kind of events. And the um, event that I've done recently was with this really amazing 
uh, gallery in Kansas City where my boyfriend and I made these works of about 30 pieces combining um, painting and ceramics. Oh gosh, okay, it's five minutes, but um, yeah, so um, sorry I was a little bit nervous, but this is my practice. You can follow it and just kind of, uh, if you wanted to explore and see kind of how ceramics can jump into this new game, um, yeah, you should look into it. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Isolina. That was amazing. <laughs> um, now we have, last but not least, we have John Che for presentations. Okay. And John is a multidisciplinary artist whose work investigates how in identity is constructed and how identity functions in relation to ideology. He studied at MICA with a BFA in painting and an art history minor in the fall of 2010. Ten years later, he received his MFA in painting and printmaking at the v Virginia Commonwealth University. He was a 2021 McDowell Fellow and a resident at Yaddo 2022. His recent exhibitions include a solo exhibition at DDDD Gallery and at March Gallery in NYC. He has a forthcoming exhibitions at Tap Gallery in Montreal and at Institute 193 in Lexington, Kentucky. He lives and works in Richmond, Virginia, and is an, 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 an instructor at Old Dominion University. Please give a warm round of applause for John Che. Hi, everybody. Oh, I was going to try to fix the closed captioning, but I don't think we can. Um, let's see. Okay, um, so first, thank you to FYE and Student Engagement for having me, and special thanks to Mina Chan for all your support throughout the years. Um, so on the theme of transformation, I'm starting with Martin Wong because um, getting to know his work was transformative for me as an artist. Uh, Wong was a Chinese-American painter who passed in 1999. I began I became familiar with his work while working at PPOW, which manages his estate. And during my time there, uh, there were pieces like this that always stuck out to me. Uh, I couldn't figure out the level of sincerity in the work, and I was drawn, but also kind of felt it was a little cringy, the excessive Asian-ness, or its kitschiness, its kind of hyper-Asian-ness. Um, Martin Wong is actually more f famous for this style, it was documenting New York in the 80s and the neighborhood that he lived in, which was Loisada, and the New Yorkian community around him. Um, uh, and as much as I love this work, it's his Chinatown paintings from the 90s that really affected me. And uh, it was his last uh, major series uh, that he made before dying of AIDS in 1999. And again, it's this ex excessive Asianness. Um, this imagined, fictional, visually generous vision of Chinatown that I couldn't stop looking at. And um, I feel like I couldn't figure it out until I let go of what I now see as a limited understanding of authenticity. Um, and it took me you know, about 10 years to really come to grips with this notion of self-orientalization, and uh, which I understand as playing into globalized fantasies of Asianness in order to be seen, to be legible, marketable, or part of the joke. Um, uh, I realized I had come to the end of some sort of cycle and had reemerged in some way. And uh, I, I think of the Klein bottle as a useful metaphor for um, this experience of grappling with one's identity and its representation. So I began to see how any rejection or um, embrace of Asian aesthetics or content is usually the same side of the same path, or, or opposite sides of like the same path. Um, so it allowed me to extend a great amount of sympathy towards myself and towards other artists um, who were going through similar experiences. 
um, it also really opened up my work. The work began to fully embrace contradiction, ambivalence, um, posturing, fragmentation, and it began to focus on hybridization as a means towards mutation, a means towards new like aesthetic potential. Um, when it came to the subject matter and narratives driving the work, I began to focus on answering very basic questions. A question like, why is my first name an anglicized Bible name? And why is my middle name my Korean name? And why is my family devoutly Christian? So pursuing these basic questions would often lead to layers and layers of research, which branching out into different narratives from the familial to historical, to the religious, to the political. And each of these narratives led, toward, led towards incorporating a wide range of aesthetic techniques and material choices. And I always um, attempted to fuse this wide range of influences and uh, this wide spectrum of time uh, and like contrasting visual languages. Um, and whether it was successful or not, I always let my sincerity guide the approach. Um, the work was coming from sincere, sincere questions, so I let the sincerity inform my formal decisions. Um, these are install shots from an exhibition titled Good Faith, and this is an excerpt from the statement. Uh, I create artworks that deeply investigate narratives that have constructed my sense of identity. Stories about missionaries, immigration, new beginnings, failure, martyrdom, the common theme being an entanglement between desire and fear. I'm interested in why people make the decisions they do, why they convert, sacrifice, and forget, and through this, change in the face of adversity and opportunity. Um, lately, my work has shifted from a more historical and family narrative-based approach towards the American imaginary. And I started with a series of Boy Scout drawings that I made after a long break. Um, I didn't make any work during 2020 and 2021 for reasons which we all understand. And this was the first series that came out. Um, from there, I found myself drawn towards images of the West, horses, cowboys, the landscape, and grappling with this term neo-settler. Um, now that I, and, and grappling with this question, uh, now that I know I'm here to stay, what is my relationship to this land, to those who are here and have come before me, and the entanglement of history that has brought us all together? Um, so at the center of this pursuit is always a move towards mutation and hybridization and a focus on fear and desire and how those you know, affect the decisions that we make. So thank you. <laughs> I stay up here. We're going to have all the panelists come up on stage for the question portion of it. So Tyler and Isalina, you guys can join John up here. And I'm going to be uh, here with a microphone to come around to uh, give it to people who have questions so everybody can hear. Now we will start the panel discussion. We have a couple questions based off of the theme for the afternoon, but we want all of your questions shortly after. So during this time, start preparing your questions and we appreciate your patience and your participation. So question for John, what trends in your industry do you feel like are going to become relevant in the next few years? This can be style, new types of experimentation or themes. Um. I, I'm not quite sure about trends. <laughs> I mean, there's all that I, all I can base this answer off of is what I'm interested in and what my, I see my friends doing. And I, I do see a kind of a move towards things that are clearly handmade and have this sort of very human quality. And um, I think a, away from, I don't know, just simple painting, kind of a horse or pastoral <laughs> imagery. For some reason, I feel comfort from that. I think uh, maybe it was so much screen time during the pandemic or something, but I think that's definitely something that I'm more interested in. Um, Thank you, John. Um, now we have a question for Tyler. 
Thematically, are you seeing patterns in your work? What kind of directions do you see yourself going into with your projects? Oh, thematically. Um, <laughs> for me, I've always been drawn to like the everyday and like what's beautiful about like just being here, I guess. Um, like I, if I ever had to sell my storyboards to someone, I think the first thing I always say is that I find like the small funny things that happen to me on the day to day and I like make it funnier through my drawings and through my storyboards. Like sometimes the things your friends say to you are like just enough to get a story across <laughs> and to tell a story. Um, and yeah, what was the second half of the question? What kind of directions do you see yourself going into with your projects? Yeah, directions I see. Um, yeah, I've been trying to focus more on telling stories that maybe I'm not so interested in telling, or like, aren't for me, but are for others, because I, I feel like a lot of my work is very personal, because I had to like sit in my studio alone for two years due to a <laughs> pandemic, so I make things that I want to see, but um, especially working in animation, you have to tell stories that are going to sell, quote unquote, and trying to play around with the ideal of things that are like so personal to me, but will also be interesting for like a five-year-old kid to watch on a Saturday morning for like with their family. That things that like moms are gonna think are funny and like eight-year-olds are gonna think are funny and trying to tell a story that isn't always just for me but is like for a general audience. Thank you. Um, Iselina, are there any new materials that you are using or new techniques that you found work best for you? I think speaking about material, um, I'm definitely pulled towards using ceramics to inform uh, how you shape and you relate to medium. So mm -hmm. I have a lot of friends doing like marble carving or limestone carving, and I think um, you know taking away from material instead of like doing an additive approach is something I'm interested in a lot. Thank you. Um, and John, uh, what obstacles should students anticipate in a professional art career? <laughs> a lot of obstacles. <laughs> yeah, you get the difficult one. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think don't put yourself on a timer and uh, feel like you should be at a certain place at a certain time. I think if you are clear with what, what you want to make and why you want to make it and understand that it's going to extend your whole lifetime just uh, you know dedication that's that's definitely the thing that's going to pull, pull you through and friendships and mentors and family and so um yeah there's no rush <laughs> <laughs> thank you question for a selena what does your daily routine look like do you have any tips or tricks that help you that you would like to share with our audience today I guess like one routine that I really kind of prize is getting into the studio in the morning. Like during daylight hours is really important. Um, and it might seem like something a little bit arbitrary to talk about, but when you can kind of find like the perfect, and I know it's hard to find like work-life balance, but um, I think you can get so tunnel vision in a studio and get so obsessive with like, the grind that you forget that there are people out there that you love and care about and um, you'll start to disappear from their lives until you kind of get that studio ground and like uh, that time and like those boundaries made clear when you start. So as you go forward with this lifestyle, it can kind of be led with a lot more intention and a lot more like communication with people. So yeah, I try to, if I have a residency, I get there the minute it opens when no one's there, like six, seven in the morning. And then I try to just work with like complete kind of like a isolation for about like six, seven hours. And then I go give someone a hug, like someone that I love or like a friend. Um, and I see like art shows that are going on or I just try to, I try to definitely, you know, stay like zoomed in in my practice and then zoom out to understand that like I'm a person in the world and there are other people there too. <laughs> That's kind of, I don't know if that answers the question. No, you did, thank you. Yeah. Um, question for Tyler. In your opinion, what qualities would you say make people successful in your line of work? Everyone's going to say this, and it gets really annoying, I know, but like be a nice person. <laughs> um, uh, I feel like uh, I was told, I got to the Nick Artist Program finals. Um, I didn't get it, unfortunately, but I got to the finals, and this is a very competitive thing. It's like 
5,000 people, and it, they narrowed it down to like six finalists, and I was one of those six. And the reason why I was one of those six is because uh, the answer I gave in one of my interviews was that the quality that I appreciate the most in myself as a worker is that I can find a way to be nice to people. And I feel like in art, especially, it's easy to get like megalomaniacs with big heads and stuff who think that they're like they said they can do the S word. I don't know if I can curse, but like, um, it's just, it's but like when you're someone like, who's no. willing to come down it's to earth and like mentor people and be kind yeah. and talk to others and just be like nice to work with, it'll get you so many jobs. I swear, like just be, people will want to hire you simply because you were their friend on another show. So like, just keep that in mind. Like I know it's really annoying because I feel like every teacher says that to you, but like being nice is really like the best thing you can do for your career and also just to be like a good person. So yeah, like just keep that in mind. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is now time for our Q&A portion. We're going to encourage the audience to start raising their hands if they have any questions. Um, and we're going to have a microphone over to you shortly. So don't be shy. Ask the questions, please. OK. Um, OK. Um, question for Tyler. Um, how do you go about finding mentorship, mentorships in animation? Uh, good question. Um, I know Twitter is like a hellscape. But um, I think Twitter is like honestly one of the best places for finding it. Um, like I said earlier, like finding a group in a niche that you fit in, not to be like a niche, but you know, if you're a <laughs> woman or non-binary person, woman in animation is a great way to find a mentorship. Um, if you're black, black and animated, it's a good way to find a mentorship. It's just like finding these, um, these groups that you can join and finding out within them like who's willing to mentor you. Or you can go on Twitter and a lot of like artists will be like, hey, I'm opening up mentorships. Um, there are classes too you can take, uh, not to be like you have to pay to learn, but like <laughs> if you want to, like there's things like Project City and um, Con Concept Design Academy and like things you can do after graduation that will also be another like supplemental class um, if you have money. But I'm not going to tell everybody to go buy these $400 classes, but like if you can. <laughs> yeah. um, but like, like I said, just finding a group first is the best way to find a mentorship usually. All right, thank you. This is just kind of like a general question for all three of you guys, but like what kind of resources at MICA or like just in our undergrad education in general do you think we should take advantage of being like first, mostly first year students and still having like the privilege of three years on our hands to get started on our careers and such? Um, so I came into MICA not having like any background in the arts, so like you know, besides kind of like high school art, uh, like I went like ballistic in the ceramic studio, the wood shop, the metal shop. They have, um, at least for the ceramic studio, unlimited access to materials, to firing. Um, you have like amazing professors and cohorts that help you fabricate like literally anything you want. It's the most instantaneous, most like beautiful and like potently historical medium that you have like full range of too. And um, coming from like a craft background with like a lot of interest in woodworking as well, I was downstairs a lot in uh, the Fox building. So I would definitely suggest you take advantage of those programs a lot. Like if you haven't taken a, like a, a ceramics one class, you definitely should. And then if you go to the sculpture department, they have biofabrication and digital fabrication. And so you get access to the most like innovative and most like brilliant uh, facilities and equipment and mines, of course. And so those things like changed my life and got me so excited to like run out of the school and seek more of those um, ways of making. And so, yeah, those are the most brilliant type of, yeah, take advantage of those programs for sure. Yeah, I'm a piggyback off of that. I think the biggest regret I have is like, I didn't get to do what Selena did and take ceramics because I thought that was like the coolest class and I just didn't have space for it. Um, like the, the best part about MICA is that at any point you can hop over to another major and like learn something else. And I think some of the coolest work I've seen when I was here was the kids who were like in fibers and in animation and were somehow tying those things together. Like that blew my mind. So like taking advantage of the fact that like you have the power to like do anything at any time is really cool. I also think that like for me, if you're someone who is really worried about like 
how you're gonna graduate and your career after graduation. Career development was the biggest help for me. Um, it got me a lot of like internship opportunities and helped me out a lot for like, you know, student like volunteer programs and stuff that would help my like resume and things like that. So like definitely go help and talk to like career development because they're definitely there to help you and they want to be bothered. So. Yeah, uh, it's been a while since I was at my cup, so I, but I do remember how a lot of those skills um, came in handy for jobs later, and like woodworking came really handy for fabrication, and um, um, fibers is actually reincorporated into my practice now, and um, I guess it's also similar to what you are saying, you get the confidence of knowing that you can learn something easily and quickly so when someone for a job later is like can you do this it's like not, I, I'm kind of familiar with that but let me watch some YouTube videos and then <laughs> you're like well I'm really good with my hands and making things so I'll figure it out and How do you go about balancing creative fulfillment and sort of the economic side of things? Because sometimes buyers don't always want the same thing as what you creatively need. I can jump in on that one because I feel like, especially as an animation person, like we have an industry um, that pumps out like, you know, content, like we are a content creation industry. Um, and especially now with like the way shows are getting canceled and things like that, like what the industry wants to make is not necessarily what I want to do. Like I'm really focused on young adult animation and things that are like for a teenage audience. And I think the best way to like do both is sort of what Iselina was saying earlier. It's like you got to like know when it's your job time and like when it's time for you personally to like work on things so that you're not burnt out by the thing like you love. Like I love storyboarding. Do I want to storyboard preschoolers all the time? No, but like that's what I got to do to pay the bills, right? So like when I have time to like sit down and do things that make me happy and remind me like why I'm in this field. Um, I think you're always going to have to make money. Um, so in some ways, that's like a, at least for me, it was like a separate skill, whether it's serving tables or doing fabrication or art handling. Um, but I kind of made that choice of like, I don't want it to be like a double slap in the face in terms of like my education I'm in debt for. And I have this pressure within the society to make money but I don't want to make my art about that too. Like, cause then it feels like it's taking both away. So I, as much as I could, I, I teach now to make money and I try to keep those things separate. And um, I feel still fulfilled from just making work, even if it doesn't sell, it's, you know, it's for me, so. Um, going off of that, I feel like whatever kind of, um, whatever your medium or the kind of point of interest you've taken, you can find jobs that are in respect to that, like in relation to that. So as a ceramicist, like, um, and so as a ceramicist, as the kiln technician or as, the, as a teacher, studios will facilitate your practice by giving you access to the studio materials, like um, a space as a staff member or instructor. So for me, I've been able to kind of like, you know, really, shove my foot in the door and be like, okay, like there's a way where I could spread like my love for this craft or this medium and this like way of making that's very insane and like show people that like you can like live a life where you could, you know, do what you love and share what you love. So if you're, um, I think like just to go off of John, like if you're into teaching or like hanging out with people and like showing them um, this lifestyle, you could balance both and it feeds each other in a way. Instead of doing something completely unrelated, maybe it's good to turn off your brain and do that for some people, but you can finesse where you could be taken care of and you know produce work at the same time. Hi, okay, good. <laughs> um, this is really going out towards you, Selena, because like, I was hearing you talk about residencies, and I'm like, "Whoa, residencies!" Because <laughs> um, that's what I'm really interested in. So, really, all I just want to ask is, like, what's your, what's really your advice when it comes to like finding residencies that you want to do? So, um, 
I think like when I first started applying to residencies, I just wanted to do one. And so I wouldn't really check like how they would kind of accommodate or take care of an artist besides like um, giving them the time to do work. I think, uh, for example, like during the pandemic, um, I applied to about like 40 residences my senior year, like right before graduating. And um, it was through the help of my professors where even like the order of images and like the quality of images and the quality of your writing, of course, come into play which is what I was like hyper fixated on, like looking good on paper. But the second half is making sure that wherever you go could financially support you or you could find like a part-time job or some type of like um, monetary like, you know, compensation through teaching or uh, just setting up a type of means where you could not only be provided the space, for example, to make work, but um, depending on the competitiveness or like the different calibers of like where you apply, uh, it's making sure that you could like financially support yourself while doing it. So like it looked like working at Home Depot and teaching and uh, working like 80 hours a week so I could go into the studio, which was like torture. And then going from that type of setup where I didn't really research a lot of like um, how I could actually like sustainably make work at one residency that was long term to a shorter one where everything was compensated for. Um, it's definitely doing like both of that research, like making sure that like, even um, if I know that the graphic design program here is like really great. And so marketing yourself with like maybe a logo or something that can set your, the way you're presented to differently. And um, that can like kind of watermark all of your writing and uh, your resumes, for example. Um, it's like the little things that will really impact and like just thinking a lot about the details um, and how you make like going forward. Does that help at all? <laughs> yeah. I'm not exactly sure if I've formed my question completely yet. So bear with me as I get this out, and I think it's for all of you faculty here at MICA, and I think that we set our students up at their time at MICA of believing that a life as an artist is the quantity of making and endurance of making and what we put our students through for you know, eight semesters while they are here. And I think all of you spoke about a little bit of a break or time or space in your making. And I wonder if you could talk about that, both in terms of the reality of life after art school and also like the benefit of that, those gaps in creating. And I also just want to say that I'm a firm believer of like getting out of ruts or, you know, any time you're stuck is to make and make, make, make. But I, I heard you each speak a little bit about, you know, a break from your own work. And I wonder if you could talk about that and its value or maybe its hardship for you. I can start on that one. Um, I didn't take a break. I did, but like the way I, I'm kind of the type of person, I'm like type A Capricorn. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I like to just work and work and work. And I, I feel like a lot of the times, I also think like as a black woman too, I feel like I, I often like to compare like how much I'm making to like my work. Um, because like I can, you know, like there's a whole lot to go into that. But like, you know, like as, as like a person who, you know, judges herself based on how much she's making, it's hard for me to take a break, but I, I know what happens if I don't. Like, I've seen what happens to people, like, you know, the carpal tunnel, like the trouble sleeping, and so I've, I've always been, like, a strong proponent of go to bed. <laughs> but, like, yeah, in, in terms of, like, I feel like I'm currently in a rut in terms of, like, my own personal storytelling, and, you know, I think it's just when you're in those places of, like, solitude and like when you don't have a project due every day like in Micah and things like that when you really don't have a rush to make something it, it feels weird going from making something every day to not and I think it's it's also it's like a blessing like when you have those moments where you're like I have no ideals like just turn on everything everywhere all at once and like just turn your brain off 
and just enjoy like media. And I feel like I, I have the best aha moments when I'm just like sitting and waiting for my tub to fill up. <laughs> and like those moments in life when you're like really not doing anything, I think are the best parts of life and what bring creativity out. And yeah, no, it's hard. Cause like I said, I graduated in a pandemic when a lot of people did stop and I was like, no, animation's booming. So I have to like get in now while I still can. Cause otherwise it's gonna be hard again. So I didn't have that pandemic break. I think a lot of people gave themselves. And I think if you get a chance like that, take it please. Like turn on Korean dramas and just like <laughs> turn your brain off and enjoy. Cause it's like, your worth is not equivalent to how much you make and people will always see your art for what it is and not for, oh, did you post yesterday? Did you make a storyboard last month? Did you do that and that and the other thing? Like people want to see you improve, but they don't want to see you improve at the cost of your health, right? So that's just something I keep in mind. Well, during the pandemic, when there was no access to facilities, I kind of was like, oh man, like that's all I have is, you know, like the act of making. But I think a lot of the times people could kind of lean on the act of making as like a crutch for not developing like critically. And so I spent, and I know John mentioned it a lot, like I spent the whole pandemic um, like researching like the entire history of ceramics and like it was nuts. And I was, um, trying to even make this like database of artists that were like multicultural like myself to kind of better understand and like comprehend my place in the world, which led me to doing these like interviews where I talked to artists like all over the country and like all over the world. And that was for me like as vital as like, you know, discovering the phenomenon of like making and having amazing professors kind of like push me to continue on um, and like to dig deeper in what I'm doing. Uh, so it was as vital going to school as it was, you know, doing all of that research about like my kind of, you know, point of interest in my practice. So I definitely think that like being comforted about everything you're doing as like field research um, is kind of like a great way to frame not exactly like working in the studio. But, you know, there is like uh, a lot of like potency that comes from like how you kind of create metaphor or transcend a medium beyond itself and learning how to like talk about that or better comprehend it um, just for yourself to develop your own language is like very important so that's kind of what I think like everything you're doing is just fine like you're going to be good yeah I think um, um, anytime you're not making you're still like in the world and like what Iselina is saying you can still pursue your interests and just engage with the world. And you can do that at any pace. And I had to learn the hard way to not equate my self-worth with my work. And a lot of my, I graduated my MFA in 2020 and it was really hard for a lot of us and kind of learning that lesson, like art's not gonna save us. There's so much of life just like happening around us. And, um, so I always remind myself of that and um, you also don't know what's going to be essential. Like right now, I feel very happy with where I am as far as what the work that I'm making and the vision I have for my work, and I have a lot of opportunities to show the work. But I, I, I can't say what was essential because as far as these long moments in which I was not making any work, and I was like constantly telling people like I quit, <laughs> like I give up, I'm not doing this anymore, and I think just you know, support each other because being an artist is very hard. <laughs> it's very precarious, it always has been. So we need as much kindness, kindness <laughs> to ourselves and to each other and take as much time as you need, you know. So. Also, I think when you're inspired, it's not a problem. You're gonna make the work. When you're excited about it, it's almost like you, like Iselina said, you have to stop yourself from working too much. So I wouldn't worry about that part, it comes. Um, just as like a side note, I the, people talk about like uh, the grind a lot, right? But they don't really talk about what happens to you after. Like you could really, and, um, yeah, I got like really, really sick, especially with the pandemic and everything. Like um, I wasn't sleeping uh, really. Like I was just like rushing to the studio, rushing to my part-time jobs. I wasn't really taking care of little things that I thought were arbitrary, like eating balanced meals or like um, staying hydrated. Like so like, 
all the little things that you like really kind of like as like a p art school punk you like you don't really care about like oh I don't care like I'm just gonna hang out with my friends I'm gonna do whatever I want and I'm gonna make really fun work like um, when you try to sustain like a really like hectic lifestyle outside like you'll just have to like literally your body will have to recuperate after so you just like have to listen to all of us. Just like yeah, love yourself. <laughs> love yourself. No, yeah. but um, go to bed. Yeah. yeah, like even if you don't want to, like it's not. You can't sustain a manic making kind of like routine for long. Like I know everyone's hustling now. None of us here really, but like the, I mean they are. But the seniors are like wrapping up work and like not sleeping maybe and like all of that. And it's cool for like a time, but just like start to like. Uh, get some like healthy habits started now. I think I wish someone told me that like earlier. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you everyone. Now that's the end of our Q&A session. We would like to take this opportunity to thank the panelists, Iselina, John, and Tyler. Also, Micah, Center for Student Engagement, FYE, and Career Development. Thank you everyone. <laughs>